Az emberek, akikkel találkozunk az életünkben, az utcán vagy máshol, People we meet in the street very often are nothing more than a pair of shoes, a coat, a hat, a face, or just a skin bag. For the past, the parents, the children, the life of these people, the love, the, the joy of people, this is their fate. What, what we can see is a few organs, the skin, the face, but we don't know anything about the people. What we can see is a winter coat. We can see lots of winter coats full of feelings, memories, pain, joy, ideas, and fantastic things. The trouble is, when you have to make a presentation afterwards, you are filled with new ideas. And I was given a lot of thought by Gabor Kapitány, who said there is a kind of notional thinking and a, a kind of symbolic thinking. And if Elemir Hankish had a special characteristic, he was symbolic. He was not analytic in his way of thinking. He, he had a way of thinking which stepped over borders. Well, he could make a comparison between science and po politics, between to be or should. He, he, he didn't look at these kind of diversities. But allow me to call your attention to the analysis of artifacts and fine art. Uh, well, he said that thinking is the most important thing, and maybe in symbolic uh, ideas and symbolic concepts, thinking is at the core of, of things. Now, my, in my presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about his way of thinking or mindset. It's difficult to translate into English. But when I was first asked to give a presentation, I thought I would talk about Hankish as, as the sociologist. But I should have needed some preparation to give a proper analysis. But the way he acted here in Kursag, when we talked about the research of values, uh, he actually showed and demonstrated that the value structure of the United States in the 1930s was very similar to that of uh, uh, in Hungary in the 1980s. But he said that empirical data could not really uh, support this, but he was deeply convinced that this, this was typical. So it's, it, it's a kind of a very telling uh, example. And not knowing that I would not have uh, the right amount of time, I don't know how much time, but I will tell you what I prepared with. Every person, every thinker has a kind of style, a uh, thinking style, the way they choose the topic, the way they set out to uh, debate. They have a kind of uh, chain of thinking. And for me, it was a re revelation to read through another hunkish volume and to realize how unique he was in his way of thinking. And I grew convinced from his writings from before the transition into democracy that Hankish was good at making art of small things. He was not concerned of big theories. He was not concerned with big political issues and debates and ideological debates. He was working from the Anglo-Saxon uh, books but he never dwelled on the communicative uh, uh, um, theory of communicative action. He was relying on his own senses, and I will give you an idea how you can interpret that. He looked at the micro actions of everyday life. He tried to capture small minutes uh, or small Promethean moments. He was not concerned about large things. He preferred silent issues, small transitions, small uh, meticulously drawn bits. And when he talked about socialism, he relied or, or focused on the, uh, uh, the period between the 1950s and the 1980s. And he 
was concerned about the illusions that he could trace and what was referred to as goulash communism in the West. How come it was not built ideologically into a uniquely Hungarian thing? Uh, maybe it could have been realized uh, during the, the Kader regime. Another unique character was a kind of uh, solidarity with the small uh, everyday people. And he was always uh, commiserative. He always felt what the, the, the everyday people felt. And he was a very humane person. He was interested in the people of the street. Uh, and also, when he was complaining about corruption, he actually looked at history and society uh, from a uh, mm, from a perspective from from uh, looking above. When he wrote about second society in the 1980s, in the mid 1980s, he didn't talk about uh, selling his uh, work, which was uh, uh, prohibited at that time. And actually, he could take his name off from the Paris study booklets because he was otherwise he wouldn't have been allowed to return home back then. And because after 1956, uh, he spent 10 months in prison, uh, remanded in custody, as they said. He wrote something very logical, but he didn't sign the protest uh, in 1978. And I would like to quote him that he followed Istvan Bibor, maybe not realizing this, but he did. He had a reserved kind of uh, behavior, and he had no opportunities to be very active in public life and to be really demonstrating. Uh, he had just no sense to do that, basically. What I would like to add to this uh, is a quotation from the philosopher Hegel when he says, going back to small logic, that there are some phases and stages of uh, a thought. There is um, the feeling, the sentiment, there is the sense, and there is the mind. We shouldn't stand or we shouldn't stop at sentiments. We should move on to, to, to um, go as far as we reach the mind, the mindset. And some people have great sentiments, and these people usually have great ideas, great concepts. And he was such a person. Elamir Hankish was capable of grasping uh, the essence of things before, uh, behind the everyday scenes or veils of everyday life. He was reluctant to discuss large ideological issues. In the 1960s, uh, we, there was a discussion whether it's the possession or the work that um, determines society. There was a big discussion about this, Zsuzsa Ferge and others involved. But he was not interested in this problem, really. What he wanted to achieve or talk about was the issue of the structure of the society, the issue of identity, the issue of false alternatives like poor people and rich people, those down there and those up there, those who worked a lot and others who didn't, those in power, those outside uh, uh, the, the power. So he didn't actually uh, touch up on such neurologic Point. And he was looking at symptoms. Uh, but Hegel said that uh, what you can see is the seeming reality. Hanke said that there was no social structure. What we could see, it was a state structure. But anyway, he was trying to demonstrate that he was concerned about the problems at hand. Finally, 
Allow me to say that in the study, in the second society, I think he he shows his real terrain, his real uh, interest. He knew everybody and he was relying on others, uh, other concepts. But at the end of his, st his study, he says, conjures up different ideas and opportunities. He, he, he actually foresaw the transition into democracy. He talked about a new economic model, which is a kind of self-directive socialist economy based on culture. And culture is a combination and a rich cooperation of, of, of different consciousness. Uh, he talked about democratic publicity. He talked about the trade unions. He talked about trade unions as the representative functions and dominance, social involvement in decision making, and and uh, this is what you could you could say when you talked about publicity, and that was all up to which you, he could go in the 1980s. And finally, when he grew 80 years old. There was a conference uh, organized by Professor Mislivet. Everyone was there. Everyone was there. We had Katalin Kondor and Chaba Gombar, everybody from representing the left and the right. And Hankish sort of realized a kind of intellectual position, which was a freely floating intellectual, freely floating in space. But this intellectual has a very important function, and allow me to quote from a manuscript again. In 1944, there was a discussion in England going on. Uh, Pauline and Monheim about the responsibility of an educated person. The spirit, the public spirit, does not determine a social order, but it's a kind of freely floating group of intellectuals which whose function is to reproduce itself from a social base. And this is not a hierarchical system. It's not closed, but it's dynamic, it's flexible, and it's perpetually changing, but it's full of problems. But I think this was very typical of Hankish himself. Thank you. The other remark is that basically all of us are fr free thinkers. And when I was asked to speak here, I was thinking about just to give you small morsels, food for thought for the others. So my take on what historians can learn from uh, honky. So let's ask him first if I can switch to Sun. So so I a framework within which we can analyze Hungary's history, because in itself we are unable to understand Hungary's history. So you need a framework for it, and hopefully that would help us uh, to think, but if not, then forget about it. This is very typical what he says, the last sentence. So the greatest dynamism, uh, he shares his thought, but then he kind of steps back. So maybe it's not like that, that, but that he added. Was he a historian? Before we move on with the answer, what we can learn, what historians can learn. But if you look at this, actually he was interested in one great transition, which is the 16th, 17th century England, the uh, civil war and uh, it's not by chance that together with Laszlo Markai who was very uh, knowledgeable uh, on the area he, they wrote uh, this excellent book uh, the England um, on the brink of the new era or new age and also uh, 
uh, Hamlet, uh, 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 which basically I think he was one of the dissertations for, for his candidacy. Yes. So the issue of transition on the level of the individual, also on the level of society. This is what he was, uh, uh, was exploring, and then he realized that for that you need to be more than just a literary historian, you need to be a sociologist and uh, much more. Many uh, actually criticized him for not being too empirical, and his generalization, generalizations are not empirical enough. But I think he spent most of his life, a lot of his life, with collecting empirical uh, evidence. Uh, for example, in 78, 82, and 1990, he uh, provided a great uh, review of the Hungarian society and the value system uh, based on the Rokas uh, test. And that's when he came up with these schemes that, uh, for example, there's a traditional Christian, a Puritan, a Cunula, uh, accumulator, and the consumer hedonist. And uh, this material was collected uh, uh, in a manuscript which was never published, and it was entitled Continuity and Disruption. Originally, he gave the manuscript to the Macbeth publishing uh, uh, house. It was 600 pages, but then he uh, asked it back and never gave it or returned it for publishing. Then, uh, in 1989, there was uh, Eastern European Alternatives, where he discusses usually the issue and problematics of elites. And that's already a work of a historian, because uh, Julia Foyd, Mihai Vargo, uh, sharp criticism of these people who were unable to understand, for example, how there's a transition uh, of the communist elite to a new type of elite. But what he wrote about, actually, the uh, it had more reality uh, in, in that than other works of other sociologists. What can we learn from these works and his methods? Uh, very rich uh, in empirical work, also uh, great generalizations and very bold associations. For example, this is the uh, image where the goldfish wants to escape from one fishbowl to another. There's one second of freedom that, that he has. So that are uh, the images that he used. And this is so easy to remember. And historians, sadly, don't use uh, these images. Also, the dichotomies, the crises, and the responses that, that he explored as well in great uh, depth. And the same thing, the scenarios and uh, contrasts. And now again, let's listen to one of his uh, other lectures. This is where we are at the moment, so between the two worlds. So that's the old system, which is then the rock on the left, and the other one is the right. We don't know what it's like. So that's where in the middle we are in the middle. And we all characterized by uncertainty. So this is how we try to be and build ourselves as men, a free man. So clearly he identifies the problem, the uh, issue, and then he proceeds to discuss the routes, possible routes that he foresees. The method that we can learn from is basically is uh, the the primary thesis or topics uh, that they keep recurring, coming with the strength or the power of uh, musical motives. For example, uh, it's when we read uh, his work uh, and see one of the problems recurring, uh, it's something like uh, a motive from music recurring. So this is uh, a very good example of how to put your uh, uh, how to postulate uh, a concept and then uh, elaborate it later. And also, 
basically uh, this is the cuvee of genres. He was very uh, boldly doing that, uh, just mixing and matching different genres, philosophical essays to empirical descriptions, etc. And what's very, very important that us, us historians can learn from, he's not writing for other historians. We can actually have a look at the index of his uh, scientific uh, citations. So the MTMT has 36 citations, and under 200, uh, you, you nobody. So that's not what he was about. But he paid great attention to the fact that uh, to his readers, many historians, he overlooked that all they care about is being cited and uh, that's what he uh, was different in. And uh, how we can uh, characterize him or classify him, I uh, think he was an Utwash type thinker. He was actually the, kind of the carnation from the uh, three generations and also a lot of uh, thoughts from Bibo. Uh, 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 recurring and also he took upon himself uh, uh, to play a public role but he was very uh, conscientious and a large uh, 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 scientist and this is basically a poem by Orang and this is what he uh, cited when he finished his last uh, presentation here in uh, Gersag it is all about just his uh, basically sounding the uh, the bell, and it was didn't care if the sound didn't uh, convey far. Thank you for the word, to your colleagues. Considering that time is running, I would just like to make a few comments. Uh, these comments could be the basis for bigger essays, but here is only the remarks themselves maybe just offering keywords that it might be perhaps worthwhile um, to, to go to, to elaborate on. Um, when I read uh, George Chapelli uh, and his essay on uh, uh, El actually there was a social scientist by uh, Zoltan Horvath, who wrote an essay, and he talked about the first reform generation by Kossuth and Széchenyi. There was a second generation uh, in the early uh, 18th century, and Oscar Yassi and other social scientists. And maybe it would be worthwhile to take a look at uh, this uh, third generation. He Hankish talked of two generations, actually, but there is a third one, and there are several uh, representatives from, from various areas, uh, including, for instance, Agnes Heller, uh, th those were the dis disciples of uh, Lukács, uh, and uh, Janusz Kornai, mathematician, and Janusz you know, Such from uh, uh, the historic, among the historians, and Elamir Hankish belongs to this third generation. Maybe it would be worth looking at it and, and putting Elamir into this picture as well. The second essay topic that I would like to say is uh, the courage that Elamir uh, had. He has a very interesting heritage. I think we could have a debate on this. He started from literature and from history, I think rather from history, from literature. And then he moved into the area of sociology, and then he became a politologist, and then he finished off as a philo philosopher. It's a very organic development. He always analyzed symbols, he looked at the values, but it was a very courageous work and, and over. Uh, obviously, there are some dangers in it. It's more, it's safer, it's more comfortable and convenient if you are just uh, a scientist and you don't put your own work at risk. So I think he was quite the opposite. He was a risk taker and he, he, he ventured to move on uh, to different areas. In the last uh, period, of his offer uh, was uh, when he debated or discussed three questions of philo philosophy. One was the issue of civilization or theory of civilization. And in his work, Fears and Symbols, he talks about these ideas. 
and the core of this theory is about an unknown word a human being uh, ends up in and what we want to do is tame the civilization maybe it would be worth comparing uh, uh, a theory of Bibi, Bibo and uh, Jan Patochka's essay which talks about very similar issues. Another problem that uh, Hankish uh, tried to, to look at as uh, a kind of symbolism is uh, the symbols, well, in general, and uh, the anal anal analysis of symbols in everyday life. I think he was the most virtuoso in this when he analyzed the uh, the symbolicism of cars and, and other everyday issues, gods and goddesses, for instance. And the third issue was the existential issues, the meaning of life and death. These were the big issues that he elaborated on. And he writes about these things in the last two works of his, and it, it's, it offers a very nice uh, prospect. Uh, <laughs> I can stop any time, so Bella, please indicate when I should stop. I also put down a term, religious uh, uh, turn, and it was an exa exa existentialist concept. The person is put into a vacancy, and you need to, to do something, a civilization of this nothing. It's something like Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, writes in his life. But in the fall of Icarus, you can see that behind the symbols, Hankish is already building a new life. He, he tries to trace a uh, transcendent behind the profane. And this is what the uh, deciphering of symbols are based on. He actually doesn't uh, dwell too much on this turn. Um, we could also write or take a, 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 a bigger look at his approach uh, or attitude to science. And I wrote a longer essay in, in a study in a journal, and I try to see how he is related to sci sciences and how he's actually uh, getting away from it at the same time. I think the list can go on. Thank you for your attention for the time being. I actually prepared with a footnote only to the small uh, science of uh, the science of small things, and the illustration is a piece of artifact here. If you want to know a little bit more about the objects of uh, toothpick containers, and you have seen China uh, versions of this function. You could have the aesthetic beauty that you marveled at, but you also could have a sort of discomfort. Uh, looking at the form of this toothpick holder, it's not the same as other similar objects available in the Carpathian Basin. They are usually very um, rectangular, which were actually produced and manufactured in a China factory near Vienna. And uh, also raise the question to anyone who was uh, researching the history of the toothpick holders. Now, if uh, it was a, uh, uh, why weren't they possible to um, transform these kind of toothpick holders into, to bring them into Hungary? Because there was another uh, manufacturing company in uh, the south of Germany which preferred the round forms. And this in Hungary, which sort of follows the oval forms, and there are some other round forms, but still horizontal on the two sides. It's something unheard of in Hungary. Although the basic structural characteristics sort of evoke the toothpick holders that we once were familiar with. If you came a little bit closer, you could see these are beautiful floral patterns. And perhaps you should know that China ware is usually painted by women. And despite the fact that we have mass production here, but there are no two similar ones because you can't paint the same rustic ones. No matter how many you want to collect, they will all be different. Uh, 
anyone who does not understand why I'm doing this to you. Well, I can tell you that in Alamir Hankush's book, The Unfinished Man, there are two uh, pages devoted to the beauty of a salt shaker. I think you it's it's worthwhile taking a look at this wonderful two pages because you will have plenty of food for thought. But I'm going to make a new pass, pave a new way, uh, following in his footsteps. Uh, we have no toothpicks in the toothpick holder. But at the end of the 19th century, I could not have had because there were no toothpicks available. The toothpicks were provided from manually from um, the, um, the feather of the geese. And other, the higher uh, parts of the society had very unique things made of gold, made of uh, aluminium. It, they were made very personalized. They had their own individual toothpicks and solving their own hygienic and sanitary problems. But in order to have uniquely manufactured wooden toothpicks, eh, we had to wait a little bit longer, uh, probably uh, due to economic, social, culture, and other problems. But I'm going to share the hypothesis with my audience here. That El Amir Hankish was a new historian, a seditious one. He was actually, well, why don't we have the toothpick in this holder is something that he would have wondered at. It was a, a long compound sentence. And if I want to ask this, follow the same structure and ask if at the end of the 19th century, a manufacturer in um, Massachusetts uh, and the son of this person uh, wanting to become a manager and had he not chosen Brazil, maybe we wouldn't have ended up with uh, two wooden toothpicks, mass-produced wooden toothpicks, because Brazil was the only country in the world where, at that time, people were using toothpicks made of wood, rosewood, by the Brazilian elite at that time, which actually sort of saves overseas the wooden toothpick culture. And this is what the Massachusetts-based person realizes when visiting Brazil and realizes the wonderful opportunity of making toothpicks and in one moment basically condemns this old traditional toothpick company to death. And now, only offering you a few brief insights into the history of toothpicks. There is a, a number printed at the bottom of the China where uh, we should unveil the secret and tell you that this was uh, a left on China company number, which is nothing but a tradesman um, commercial vendor from Budapest who escaped to the United States and during the Second World War he realizes that the China were produced in Japan would work wonderful on the American market and George Zoltan Lefton's company commences to start uh, commences to produce such things uh, makes wonderful sortiments and in which you can find three such toothpick holders which are a little bit of a step away from the Central European identity and following the Art Nouveau spirit and uh, squeezing the spirit into the uh, manufacturing of, uh, uh, of toothpick holders. I think it's a beautiful cultural hybrid, a wonderful symbol, and allow me not to mention any more details from Lefton's life. Now, why did I say all this? I think it was worth introducing the history because of the parallelism of Hankish's uh, salt shaker is because objects which could be used as illustration and the story behind the objects and the mental objects and the cooperation and the interlinkedness of these things I think could be a basis for new forces, new ideas and pretty big things if you come to think of it. If we look at objects, things, 
and we organize them into a functional system. It's something like uh, uh, the process uh, of new historicism, which was a kind of direction at the end of the 1990s. If you look at the books by Greenblatt, it's also popular in Hungary. And if you try to follow the history of a bishop, for instance, or if you make a statement that one manuscript discovery of a humanist, somebody discovers something and then saves this act into the new world and then maybe establishes modernity and the period of renaissance, I think this is something you can see the parallelism between that and my toothpick holder. Allow me to finish by saying that although Hankish was a new historian and not following the old traditional uh, convictions and concepts, he sets up new categories, new constructions, but we did not mention or have not mentioned the kind of background on which he relied very heavily, complex systems in, 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 uh, in literature, in history, in politics. So he's also uh, somehow sat into a systematic approach. And what I also wanted to say, which uh, another hypothesis which is not crystallized yet, that archaeologists describe this meeting of three things, objects, people, and concepts. It's the t it has been described as the entanglement of things. And it can actually generate a fantastic reconstruction of power once we are able to grab, grab or grasp uh, the, 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 the major notions and major points of these meeting points. Uh, Ted Dawson also came up with a novel notion. He coined intertwingularity, which was a new, new idea, which says that mutually interlinked things or objects will um, create a big unity because uh, based on the networks and due to the networks which allows us to get to different places so it's the intertwingularity refers to the final outcome I think in many social sciences uh, show, uh, describe this as a kind of no human turn this is one aspect or one explanation you can get to one point from several directions and historians usually are the, the flag wavers of, of, of such a, a process. So Funkish could actually look at one single object and he could end up um, uh, in, in to describe the word freedom. So from this non-human turn, he always stopped at notions and people. He was not so much interested in objects. Thank you. I would have talked about one of Hankish's work, which is the uh, trap of the missing hero, because I remember on, we were on the way to Lake Balaton with my parents at the time when the Skodas and Zhigulis and the uh, Ladas laden with uh, suitcases, and obviously these used to fall off the top of the uh, cars. But as a historian, I would have talked about the heroes we have, for example, the hero square that we actually have, which is the central location for uh, politics. And if you think about the fate of uh, Franz Joseph in 1990, he set off, uh, but uh, instead of the Gabriel uh, Archangel, there was a seven meter high mox. Uh, statue and then the emperor on the way back in 1926 uh, uh, in his uh, procession but without his crown he was standing there um, for the next 20 years and what Hungarian historians can uh, uh, do with this problem of uh, identity but uh, Imresh uh, uh, said uh, that Morni uh, you were to uh, talking in such uh, sort of a dry fact that uh, the 
gossips are missing. Okay, let me share you then a couple of gossips. One being that, or rather that the story, which is the walking uh, coat, winter coat. So uh, there were, yeah, three people I remember. Uh, Shigre was the last uh, owner, a nobleman, and he was actually, he lost uh, his, not just la his life, but his head uh, in battle, and Kazinci wrote about him, and we decided, some of us, uh, especially Peter Bokanyi, to discover and, and ex uh, research, and uh, people said that uh, he was not a prominent figure. The other interesting figure of this uh, palace, uh, with Sándor Tatai, who actually uh, operated a workshop there for graphologists. This is a, a palace, uh, a noble palace. The facade was created in the 18th century and never would have imagined that Tatai would end up there. And the data we uh, came across in the uh, uh, Kursag uh, local paper uh, and there was an advert put, a small ad put there, who, in which he advertised himself and his graphologist services, and he was so popular. And uh, Tatai is an author. Obviously, a lot of people know his work for youth uh, uh, novels. He was very successful. He was quite a strategic strategist. So he basically questioned the maids and then he once he found out everything from the maids about the family then based uh, on the stories he could then tell the uh, his uh, take on on all the the families so everybody was shocked how much he discovered from from the mere handwriting the third story is a story of a spy a, uh, a lady spy and his and her uh, husband was a consul in Istanbul in between the two world war in 42-43 basically they knew that she was coming or traveling to Hungary and he, she was working for Churchill when they took a letter delivered a letter to Sokocic but straight after the delivery basically was revealed what her mission was and she was uh, imprisoned and she was also sent to the gulag for a few years i only shared these stories uh, because with you because these buildings uh, not only have rich history and stories you can even call them gossips if you wish but i think they they more like very strong central european life stories of faith thank you